I do have a, a, speci- a special message for you guys this morning, a message which sort of came to me after reading a passage from the scripture. It became sort of like a steer in my heart, and then really encountering a few people in a rough patch of their life, I realized there's a great need to share with, with you. And it's a message for those who know that they have a purpose. And by a raise of hands, who, how many of you believe you have that God gave you a purpose, a clear purpose? Come on, courage. How many of you believe that God has given you a purpose on this earth? Okay. Okay, there's many of you. Okay. Maybe some of you have, haven't received that purpose yet, but maybe it becomes a bit more clear after this, this, this message. You've received the calling, you know the purpose, you know where God wants to bring you, and yet, you sort of deviated from it. You're in this place this morning, you're here with me right now, although not very receptive, but you're here with me, and I've kind of fallen off track. You know where God wants to bring you, he gave you that purpose, the plan, that dream, And yet, you're sort of swayed by, either by maybe being a bit too busy, doing certain things, being unfocused, procrastinating on the things maybe of this world or or of the desires of the flesh, and yet you feel a bit deviated from the purpose God has given you. And maybe you're actually in the middle of a storm, maybe a trial in your life, a loss, Maybe a loss of a relationship, a loss of a loved one kind of made you feel like you're kind of sinking. That you're sort of in a shipwreck and you're just barely above water and you feel like you're kind of striving to kind of live life and yet it feels like you're barely breathing and it's just struggle after struggle and day after day and you're sort of in the same place and you're not moving towards the goal, towards the purpose, towards the mission, towards the destination God has promised you that will bring you and you sort of stay in the same place for a long time. And if you're in that place, if you're in that place coming to church for maybe years and you're still in the same place and you feel like there's no much improvement, you haven't gone up in your relationship with Christ or in the same place, I want to, share, I want to tell you that this message is especially for you. And if you're not in the storm, if, there's, if your waters are clear and you feel you're going in the, in the right direction, this message is also for you. Because in life there's seasons, there's attacks, there's troubles, there's tribulations. And in some seasons you might be in clear water, in some seasons you might be in a storm. And yet through every season, we have to be aware of that God is still at work. That God is still at work. God is still at work when you're in your blessing and God is still at work when you're in your trial. That he hasn't changed regardless of the situation, regardless of the time frame, regardless of the the way you feel, that God hasn't changed one single bit. And I want to just have a few moments of prayer before I, I begin to share with you. If you want to just bow your heads with me. Father, I pray that your word and not my words will steer our hearts. I know that nobody in this room wants to hear what I think or what I say, but we all need, including me, need your word this morning. And I pray, Father, that that word changes people's trajectory, changes people's lives forever. It's a transformative word, word. Father, in your name we trust. But we come here not before men, but we come here before you. For we want a revelation from your word and from you, we want to hear what you want to say for each and one, each and one of our lives. In your name I prayed. In your beautiful name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So the question or my sort of sermon begins like this by a simple question. How would your life look different if you knew you had everything you need? Everything you need in your situation, 
right here, right now, in your problem, in your uncertainty, in your doubt, if you knew you had the solution, if you knew you had everything, but I mean everything, that toolbox which would have get you through, or set of tools which would have get you through past this situation, this moment, how would your life look like? How would your future look like if you knew you had everything you needed in life to achieve the purpose God has given you? And we'll be looking at a text this morning from Acts 27. If you have your Bibles, please open with me. If you don't, make sure you bring them next time. We don't, on purpose, we don't really put verses on, on the screen because we want people to use the sword, to use the Word of God. And if you don't bring it to church, I'm not sure how much you read it at home. But I hope you do. So this passage, if you've been around church for some, for some time, you're probably aware of it. You know some of the details, maybe not the fine print, because Paul, he was a man of detail. And I think we can go so deep into the story and we get to see, and we get to see the, the geography behind it. We get to understand that these, were, these are actually places that Paul had to go to on his journey to fulfill his purpose. This is not some fables. This is not some stories we just kind of, that was just thrown into the scripture. No, this is a life exposed, expressed, showing how God brought a man from a place to another to achieve his own, the purpose God has given him. And this thing has always been on my mind. Why has Hollywood movies become so popular? Why do they have so much traction? And the truth is that those people behind these movies, they made fables, science fiction, look like real stories. And yet, an issue with maybe preachers is that they made real stories sound like fables. Maybe we lost our passion for what God has done. And maybe we're some, some, some way to blame. But these are not fables. These are real stories that, some, that people experienced. And these can be tested both through history and geography. And we get to see... Paul's journey on the way to Rome. In this passage, we see Paul being arrested in Jerusalem. And he had the power and the authority to exercise his, um, his rights as a Roman citizen to be trialed for the things he was accused in Jerusalem to be trialed in Rome. And he exercised this, this authority he had, this rights he had, and he was sailing towards Rome to stand before the man who was the most powerful man at the time, Caesar. The problem was that they began to sail in the wrong time of the year. As they were on sea, they experienced... Uh, a storm, a storm which is probably anything we've ever imagined. But the Bible describes it a little bit, and it's pretty terrifying, what people were experiencing in that storm. And in chapter 27, verse, verse 20, it says this, When neither nor sun nor stars appeared for many days, and the storm continued raging. We finally gave up all hope of being saved. These people have been in a place where they said, that's it, we're done. There's no way out. It's over, we're gonna die. We're not gonna be saved. This is a time where it's, it's all over. I'm not sure, have you ever been in a place like that? 
or you pretty much just gave up. You said there's no way out. There's no way out. There'd be train wreck after train wreck, unanswered prayer after unanswered prayer, promises seeming so, so far away, impossible to reach. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever been in a place like that? Well, you felt like there was no way out. Everything just kind of piled on. We're not going to make it true. We're not going to make it true, is what they said. Verse 21. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail for Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You will stand trial before Caesar and God has graciously given you the lies for all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men. For I have faith that God, that will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run around on some island. And if you look just a little bit lower, the header for the next passage, it says shipwreck. It was the moment they've experienced their ship collapsing destroyed and bursting from every corner. The struggle, the throwing off into the sea and the swimming to the shore. But what's really amazing is that God fulfills this promise that all, if you see a little bit lower, all 276 men survived. But what gave Paul the confidence? What gave Paul the confidence to say, this is God's going to happen. We're going to experience the struggle. We're going to experience the shipwreck, but we're all going to survive. And the Bible says that an angel appeared to him. And for, for a moment, I've thought that the angel would have had something else to say. He would have said, maybe, here's Paul, here's seven tips for survival at sea. But no, he said, Paul, you, neither, the, neither you nor the men that are with you are going to die. And you are going to make it to Caesar. So what is he actually saying is what I want to share with you this morning. It is that you're going to make it to the destination that God appointed for your life. That is my first point this morning, that you're going to make it to the destination that God has appointed for your life. Amen. Amen. Yes, okay, perfect, you're with me. Now what's interesting is that while God says that I have a purpose, which many of you have raised your hand for that, he doesn't say that it's going to come without Shipwrecks without a bit of this or part of the story which we're not very happy with. Maybe a part of the story when we feel that he's not intervening, that he's not working in that moment. But still, God says that I am going to, I'm going to accomplish with you what I've, said, what I've told you. I'm going to accomplish with you the purpose I have given for your life and the calling I have given for your life. All the way back to Acts chapter 9, we see the calling that Paul received. We see in chapter 9 that Paul was heading into a town to persecute Christians, to kill Christians. And on this journey, Jesus encounters him, saves him, restores him, transforms him, and blinds him. 
stand in the house, God calls a different believer and says, go to Paul of Tarsus and pray for him. And that believer says, no way. No way I'm going to Paul. Do you know what he's been doing? He's been persecuting, killing Christians all around. I'm not going. And God says this to Ananias in chapter 9, verse 15. Go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to the kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. In other words, this calling, this purpose, this incredible gift that God given, has given Paul to, for, of salvation was going to come with a suffering. And one of those moments, those suffering moments, is found in chapter 27 where we're just reading. And we know that there's more, a lot more that Paul suffered for, for the name of Jesus. But what did God say to Ananias? Was that Paul was going to be an instrument for preaching the gospel to the Gentiles and the kings. You see that purpose? You see the plan that God had with him? And here, he's again reminding him, reminding, reminding him, reminding Paul the purpose, the goal, that no shipwreck, no struggle, no two-week storm where you're not seeing the sun or the stars, where you're barely breathing above the water is going to stand against me or against you to fulfill the purpose I have for you. And you know what's interesting? Is that the enemy will always try to define you by your two weeks of friendship. Two weeks. Two weeks of under the water. Two weeks where maybe you made huge mistakes. You always, he's always going to tell you, oh, I told you not to go there, and yet you did. I knew you shouldn't sail, and yes, you did. He's going to try to define you by the mistakes you have committed. Oh, no way you're going to achieve the purpose God has for you. You've made way too many. You haven't kept yourself how you should have. But I want to tell you that this morning, regardless of the shipwreck you've experienced, of the sinking moments in your life, that God, if you turn back to God and you trust God, God will fulfill the promise he has in your life and the promise he has given you because his, prom uh, because his purpose hasn't changed for your life, even though we've made many, many mistakes along the way. God's purpose remains. God's plan remains for your life. And you can still put your back on course. I was asking earlier, how would your life look different if you knew you had everything you needed? And you might say, I had no angel coming to speak to me. There's no point, a supernatural interaction which I've had, I haven't had any. Do you see what Paul experienced? An angel presenting before, before him in the middle of the night and speaking to him. And I've never had any of that. But I want to tell you this morning that we have a lot more encouragement than an angel in the middle of the night. And I'll share with you where does that encouragement come from. You still might say that if an angel came to me, I would act different, talk different. I'd, have, I'd be encouraged different. I'd have more courage, more boldness to step out in this world which we're talking about, in this country which we're talking about that God will change and transform. I'll have just boldness. I could just speak to anybody about Jesus if I just had that experience. But what's, what's important is that it's not my will, not your will. That God's sovereign will, sovereign, is how he wanted it to happen. He shared his own word with us. And he didn't say for a moment 
he didn't say it, he didn't uh, share it for, for an evening or a night, but he shared it for every single moment of our life. It's here, it's available. We get a seat at the table with the, with, with the one who has made everything possible. We get to stay and hear and read his word every day. What more revelation do we not want than that? What more courage do we want than that? What more boneless do we want than that than God Almighty speaking to us? But there's more than speaking. Because Paul made it through the storm. And he got to Rome. He got to preach the gospel. And then he died for his faith. But through his journey, he got to write a lot of letters to believers throughout Asia. And one of his letters, probably the closest to my heart, is the letter for Romans. And he shares something with in Romans 8, he shares something with his people which really can change our perspective of the way God speaks to us and how much God speaks to us and how much God encourages us. And if you look at Romans chapter 8, verse 15, he says this, The spirit you receive does not make you slave so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought you Adoption to sonship and daughtership. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. We, got to, we get the call, I'm not sure if you actually understand it, to its full degree, but we get to call Yahweh, the creator of the universe, uh, universe Abba, Father. We mere creation we get now to call him Father. What more encouragement can you get than that? That he has put in every single one of us a spirit, a spirit, a Holy Spirit which screams Abba. It's not something you've done. It's not the situation you're in. It's not the shipwreck you experience. But the spirit which is in you shouts Abba. Father. Verse 16. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now we, if we are children, then we are heirs and heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that way we also share his glory. Let me read that again. If indeed we share in his suffering, in those hard times we in order that we also share his glory. And we know a few more verses down. The scripture says this, that in all things, God works together for our good, for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So if you have been called according to your purpose, know that every shipwreck, every moment, every problem every tribulation is working in according to his purpose then verse 35 who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword no for, the sake, for your sake we face death all day, he says. We are considered as sheep to, to be slaughtered. Verse 37. No, in all of these we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither hide nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that it is our, in Christ our Lord. You need an angel? 
And the angel would say, read chapter 8 of Romans. I'm telling you, that's exactly what he'd say. The, the word of God is right here, and it's applicable for every single one of us this morning. Now, after the shipwreck situation, the Bible tells us, I'm not going to get into the story too much because oh, it's going to be a long time. But the Bible tells us that they arrive on an island called Malta. Again, we know that's a real place, okay? That's not fiction, that's not a story, but it's actually a real place in, in, in the world. And the Bible says that the, the locals there, the people there, they welcomed them on the island. And they began to sort of sit with them and eat with them. And while they were there, there's another shipwreck. There's another experience, another trial that Paul is sort of receiving. And it says, while they were eating, a snake came and bit them. Excuse me. And when, when Paul seen this, and when Paul sort of had the snake on, on his arm, he shook it off. He shook it off into the fire. And look what verse 5 says. But Paul shook off the snake into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell or suddenly fall dead. That's a diagnostic. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they, they changed their minds and said he was a god. What does that tell us? Do not put too much weight on people's opinions. Because within a few moments, they change their, ve their verdict, their opinion about him from death, swelling up and dying, to a God. Because sometimes people stand with you and five minutes later they stand against you. Don't put so much weight on what people think about you, but, pe but, but put weight on what God thinks about you. So often we're stranded by other people's opinion, by what other people think about you, what other people say about us, and we get diverted, unfocused from the purpose God has for our lives. But we see here a Paul who was convinced, who was convinced that he had a purpose. Who was convinced, and that's a key word. That's a key word. And being convinced really pushes us through the hard times, through the shipwrecks. If we're not convinced that we are going towards the plan, although there's no sun for days, there's a storm for many, many days, if we're not convinced that we're going towards the purpose God has given us, we're easily swayed off, easily drowning in our own sorrows, mistakes, problems, trials, and so on. I'll close with this. And I know I don't have a title yet, but it comes. It's com it comes at the end. And I really realize that if we're convinced of certain things, we get to shake things off. We get to shake people's opinions off. We get to shake those around us who say, no, you can't do it. No, you didn't go at the right time. You should have changed direction and so on. So if we are convinced of what the purpose God, or what purpose God has for us, we know we're going in the right direction. And we can keep moving on towards the right direction. And what I believe is that when we're convinced, we know that everything that God has started with us, the plan of salvation, the privilege of salvation we have received, he will bring to a good end. He will bring not just to a good end, but he will bring to completion. He will complete the work he has in your life. And look, this, oh, 
These words have marked me forever and ever since the first moment I read them. It's the last words that Jesus shared with us on the cross. Who here knows what he said? He says, it is finished. It is finished. And for a second, the enemy and everybody around said, that's it. It's finished. He's done. There's nothing happening. It's over. All the promises and all the things and all the revelations throughout the history, it's done. It's finished. It's done. It's dead. But what the word is, now for those who speak English, forgive my pronunciation. It's telestai, which meant that it is complete. The work Jesus had was complete. Everything he had to do was done. He took the wrath of God upon himself. Died and yet resurrected. He took that wrath in order for me and you to have the bridge built. To have the bridge built from a sinful man or woman to now a holy man and woman. From guilty to righteous, he has built that bridge on which we stand and that is the bridge of Jesus' sacrifice for our lives. Sinner to holy, wretched to righteous. We weren't just lost. We were dead in our transgression, the Bible says. We were dead, and now we get to live. And we get to live eternally in the presence of our Savior, Jesus. I want to call the, the worship band on stage. And I want to tell you that this morning, maybe you knew before, maybe you didn't, but he gave you a new name, and you are called the daughter of a king. Your name is a daughter of a king and a son of a king. And you have a purpose, you're valued, you're unique, you're accepted, you're loved. You're not a byproduct of your hard times. You're not defined by your wreckship, but you are extremely valued, priceless in this world. And that is the name that God has given you this morning. Some of you must, might be going through struggles. Recently, there have been so much suffering. It felt like for years, everything was going great, and it's like, Prayer requests are piling on and on and on, and it's just harder and harder and harder. But I want to tell you this morning that Christ is enough for us. That when I say it is finished, enough is enough. He has done everything he had to do. To say that he would accomplish the purpose he has for our lives. To encourage us more than an angel can do. And to tell you that you are given a new name. And that name is son and daughter of the King Almighty. King of mighty. And now we get to say this morning, Abba, Father, come in this place. Come and show me that purpose which was clouded for so long. Come and show me the direction, the destination where I have to go. And if you have never had it, let, he, let his revelation to, to touch your mind, to touch your heart this morning. Let's stand up. And thank Jesus for all that he has done for us. That even through our ship sinking, our ship sinking, 
that he's still going to bring us to the destination. To thank us, to thank him that he has brought us from the kingdom of death. That from the worst places of the world and he has brought us into the kingdom of heaven. So let's tell him, Jesus, that you are everything we need. That you are everything we need. Everything to need to be victorious, the Bible says. To be encouraged, to step out in faith and boldness in this place you have, you have played us, placed us in for this period of time. You are, you are everything we need. And we thank you. Amen.